think most teachers are very aware that their students see them as an example. Their students look at the way they dress and they copy the way they dress and the way they fix their hair and uh, just copy so many mannerisms of a teacher. And I think that a teacher is very aware of this and very responsive to the example that they set for their students. So a dress code really isn't needed, you believe? Well, in most cases, no. There might be a few isolated cases where the dress of the teacher would would be disruptive to the classroom activities, but I don't know of any particular case where this is true. Well, it's a pretty bad thing. Uh, I guess most of us get scared about it most of the time, but uh, we try to go ahead and not think about it at all. Have you ever had a bad experience while driving with us? No, I haven't, no sir. Are you married? Yes, I am. What does your wife think about this? Well, she's not thinking too much about it right now. She tries not to think about it. She just lets me go and do what I want to do. I love to drive a bus. I like to drive, period. Did you know the driver who got shot? Uh, yes, I did. Not real personally, but I did know him by sight. the rules of appellate procedure and we would follow them and we would meet all of the time limits under those rules. I generally disagree with what Mr. Boyd says. I, uh, in all frankness, it, I think it was a close question. I think the judge uh, could have ruled in favor of the state of Texas or rule in favor of Watson and uh, apparently uh, he chose to rule in favor of Watson. I never quarrel with my court decisions. I, I have my personal opinion, but he's the judge and I'm bound by his order. There was two mad men that came in and told everyone to stand still that uh, this was a robbery and one of them proceeded down to the end of the bank and he had a satchel and he started throwing money in the satchel. The other man was waving a gun around and was telling everybody just to stand still. Did they all have guns? Uh, yes, sir. It's all. Did they threaten anyone? They, I thought they were going to threaten me. <laughs> he stuck it up in my face and told me to, I quote, hurry up, baby, throw the money up here and I'm not fooling around. So it scared me. <laughs>
Department of Corrections in Texas, the repeaters have been as low as 20 percent, while the nationwide average is 60 percent. These people who, between the times that they enter prison, if you're just thinking of the average person, they prey upon society and uh, do considerable damage. And I propose that the commissioner's courts of Dallas and Tarrant counties, as well as the legislative delegations of the two counties, get together prior to the next legislative session and plan for something very real uh, in this field and make it possible for us to make the regional jail concept into a reality. The past, the young people and, and, and the police considered it effective immediately. And in fact, Chief Wall testified he considered it effective until 4 o'clock when he was told it was not a, a, would not be effective. They did not know the penalties. They did not know when it was going into effect. In fact, they were given no information at all about the ordinance. And I was unable to find out anything about the ordinance. And we feared violence if the police tried to enforce it without an adequate explanation to the young people. In other words, you achieved what you wanted at the hearing, and that being information. Information, and we prevented a confrontation between the police and the young people on Monday night. Well, we really have a lot of options. The thing you've got to watch, though, is that you uh, you make too many options too long. You know, it takes a while to gel something, and you have to make decisions fairly quick and, and give them a chance to stay in one position and learn to play together because that's what gives the defensive back confidence is he knows where everybody else is. He knows where his strengths and weaknesses are. And uh, until he knows that, he's out there all by himself. I would assume that uh, you probably will not play Adderley this Saturday night. Uh, I would say that he would not play. Uh, I don't think he's going to have time. He's just coming in this afternoon. He's only, only have, really, we're almost through preparation this week. So I'm trying to get him ready, I think, to play against the Jets. The 1970 SMU football squad returns 20 lettermen. They return Chuck Hickson, the nation's outstanding passer. They return Ken Fleming, a good offense, an unproved defense, but one that could prove very potent. But according to head football coach Hayden Fry, their main concern is getting past Oklahoma and Tennessee. Jerry, I would say this particular season is extremely important because we have a very young, inexperienced team, and we played two of the top teams in the nation in University of Oklahoma and Tennessee our first two games. Should we not play good football against these two opponents, I'm afraid we're going to be very embarrassed, and this could lead to a very disastrous season. On the other hand, if we look at playing these two teams as a challenge and as an opportunity, and we play good football, win or lose, then I think we have an opportunity to have a good season. Where are you hurting most this year? Well, actually, uh, overall, I would say that our defensive team is by far the most inexperienced team that we've had since I've been at SMU. We have other trouble spots, such as wide receivers. Uh, all of our people are sophomores, and with a passer like Chuck Hicks, and we'd like to know that we had someone that could catch the ball. Have you ever seen a quarterback like him? As a passer, Jerry, I don't believe, and I'm sure that the NCAA uh, records will verify this, that there's ever been a passer as accurate or as good as Chuck Hicks. And now, there's other quarterbacks can do everything better than Chuck uh, as far as a running game and so forth. But from a leadership standpoint, calling his plays, using his audible system at the line of scrimmage and throwing the football, I, I don't believe Chuck has a peer. How is Gary Hammond coming along? Is he going to be tough enough to take that running back punishment? Well, this is a tough question to answer until Gary really gets into combat in game situations. We won't really know the answer to that question. But based on his performance in spring uh, and in fall workouts also, uh, Gary looks to be extremely tough. He looks like in time with experience that he could become a great Southwest Commerce football player in the backfield. So you can see the ifs are there in the SMU Mustang plans for 1970. The big one is if they can get past Oklahoma and Tennessee, they'll have the momentum going for a successful football season. Jerry Haynes, Channel 8 News, ONB Stadium on the SMU campus. Well, the government has painted itself into such a corner over the last 30 years of inflating the money supply that it's getting slowly but surely to the point where it's going to be left with just a few limited alternatives, all of which are economic disasters. 
and I can't predict a date for the devaluation of the dollar. I think anybody would be foolish to try, but I consider it 90% probable to happen sometime between this Saturday and the end of next year. Well, devaluation of the dollar would, of course, uh, come about through the uh, raising of the price for gold. Now, the official price of $35 an ounce at the present time is being substantiated by the free market price of $35 to $36. What's going to happen to put these two markets out of alignment and thus cause the devaluation? Well, first of all, a great deal of confusion exists on the subject by misunderstanding what a devaluation is. It is not a raising of the price of gold. It is not an adjustment in currency ratios. What it is purely and simply is the government reneging on its own IOUs. The government saying we issued this paper currency on the promise that 35 of these dollars were worth one ounce of gold in our treasury. And now that we find that we have overissued the currency, we're going to have to default on our promise and give you only half or a third as much gold as we promised for the paper dollars. Mr. Baldwin, what is your reaction to the judge's opinion? I think the judge is legally correct. In this particular instance, uh, in the fact that he does not have jurisdiction further? I believe he's technically correct. He does not have jurisdiction further. The request that we made in our temporary uh, application for temporary restraining order was to get the information that we obtained today. The regional jail concept, in my judgment, is the most progressive idea to be proposed for the detention of prisoners within the past 100 years. In this age, we must get away from confinement and into rehabilitation, and to work with the Texas Department of Corrections, the various counties in this area, it is imperative, in my judgment, to bring about a reduction in the number of repeaters in the field of crime. I think the judge made the only decision that could properly be made under the federal rules. The matter is still on appeal before the 
U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. And uh, so I felt like that the motion was was just not at all germane to the issues. If your motion for rehearing is denied, what will be your next move? The only alternative we would have at, at, in the event the Fifth Circuit ruled against us on motion for rehearing would be to go to the Supreme Court of the United States. And as to how long it would take for us to do that, I just don't know. or if he's not qualified for a better job or for a job or training. Foot Patrol idea came about because of the uh, density of the population in the area and because of a soaring uh, crime rate in this particular area. Uh, the remoteness of a man in a car driving down the street uh, is just too far away from the people. And so therefore we came up with this uh, old new concept, actually. Do you feel that this will be a deterrent to crime? Yes, I do. I think it'll bring about uh, uh, voluntary compliance with the law through personal knowledge of the police officers in the area by the people uh, frequenting the, this area. Do you think your foot patrolmen feel safe out on the street? I believe they do. This has been a voluntary assignment to the men. Uh, uh, each of them has uh, volunteered on their own to take this uh, assignment. The Dallas-Fort Worth Regional Airport Board passed another major milestone today with the awarding of a contract for construction of the foundations of two terminals. Executive Director Tom Sullivan recaps the event. The $45,000 contract, for example. Art Sinclair, Channel 8 News on the Move at the Regional Airport Headquarters, Arlington. Well, uh, previously when we had the uh, sort of pilot program out here and I walked with the uh, officers that had been walking, I got to know the people here in this area and when I came back to work in a normal patrol situation, I was able to deal more effectively with the people and knew them a little better and I think this would help future officers. What are the primary problems you're going to be combating down here? What's the most frequent sort of crime? Well, actually, uh, I think our presence will uh, combat the uh, strong arm robbery, uh, 
people getting mugged or their money took when they come down into this area wanting to see what it's actually like down here. Does that happen frequently? Very frequently. Are you concerned for yourself? Or are you afraid you're going to get jumped? Uh, I don't have uh, a fear for myself. I don't think it will, but if it do, I'll try to handle it. Well, the one that's most significant, and it's uh, another one of our milestones, is the uh, uh, authorization for us to enter, enter into a contract with O'Rourke Construction Company for drilling the piers for the foundations for the first terminal building, which incidentally will be Branham's terminal. How much money was involved? Uh, some $745,000. This whole airport is being built on uh, joint revenue bonds uh, guaranteed by the airlines and the other users of the airport. Uh, the only monies uh, uh, that uh, uh, the taxpayers uh, would contribute would be toward the land, and that's all. Well, I think there are several factors involved in uh, the slowness of the donations coming in at this point. Uh, one of which I feel is the, all of the publicity that uh, we've seen lately on the uh, the city budget and a uh, possible increase in taxes and a lot of people are reluctant to send in donations now for fear that uh, they're going to be paying enough in increased taxes that uh, might possibly come about so i think this is one of the factors that has led to uh, a slow response on the part of the public in bringing this goal to its uh, bringing this fund to its goal another factor that may uh, uh, come into play is one of uh, uh, the possibility of trying to create a false uh, image on the part of police with the money that uh, we're, we're asking for. What we're going to do is to supplement their income because it's not sufficient to take care of the family, but we're, we're demanding of them something in return. Now, the concept of a guaranteed income is an entirely different thing. You don't require anything of anybody under that philosophy, as they've told me, the uh, creators of the idea have told me. And they'd have it administered by the Internal Revenue Service, and you'd file a, a tax return. And if it showed that you had less than so much income, the place of paying a tax, the government would give you a refund in, a, uh, in the form of a refund. Uh, but it'd make a payment to you. Nothing be required of you. But in this instance, bear in mind, no one gets one penny out of this thing. And it's all to be paid by the federal government, not by the states. No one will get one penny out of it until that person submits himself for a better job.